track some money, then your business plan will be much more valuable and perfected. So don't waste your time up front writing this big thick document that no one's gonna probably read anyway. Just get going, start your business. Then after that, number four, define your business model. Um, no matter what kind of organization you're starting, you have to figure out a way to make money. The greatest idea, technology, product, or service is short-lived without a sustainable business model. And then number five, he talks about MAT. M-A-T. Milestones. I think it's assumptions. Yeah. And tasks. And it's important, he said, to write those down. He said, it's much better to have a list of your milestones in your lobby of your office. You know, most companies you go in, they have a nice mission statement or some corporate fluffy wording on the wall. He said, it'd be a lot better to put down your 10 milestones and the date you're gonna have them accomplished by. And then the employees coming in will see their milestones and say, wow, we gotta get that new product out by December 1st, or we're not gonna meet our milestone. And that will be a lot more meaningful than just, our company believes in helping people, you know? That's not gonna change their life. So those are the five things. So again, as, as Jeff said, a very readable book. You could sit down and you could read this over Thanksgiving weekend pretty easily. All right. Now, I'm going to ask your help for a real live semi-SE idea. This is sort of a semi-SE idea. Something that I'm looking at doing here, and I haven't pitched it to anyone but Brother Richie yet, so keep this confidential. Don't mention this to President Wilwright when you see him or something. Okay, you know, yeah, that's one thing you want to do when you're coming up with an idea. It's funny, some of the people came in and said already, oh, you, somebody stole my idea at the Great Ideas Competition, you know? <laughs> so they've already thought of misproving. So I need some help. Pretend this is you and you're coming up with an idea I need your help to decide how to make this a better idea. So this is a real world example right now, present day. I'm working on this as we speak. Pretend you are me. How can we make this a better idea? How do we pitch this idea? How do we market it better? How do we present it better to get it off the ground? Okay. Now I'm hoping all of you immediately Think in your minds the eight template ideas, right? Those eight things that you should look at for starting a business. Wouldn't that be great if all of you suddenly, when someone gave you an idea in your mind, you suddenly said, hmm, is there enough gross margin here? Enough gross profit? Does anyone, can anyone remember that far back what the eight are? Who wants to take a stab at it? Not the profit margin. Okay. GP, right? Repeat sales. Uh, which one was that? CT? It's QT. QC. Yeah. Startup cost. Cost and time was QT. Quickly test. Okay, so I would hope you, as you read this right now in the next two minutes, think of those and say, all right, how is this gonna fit in those eight things? Which of those things are gonna cause this idea to fly or flounder? So spend a, a minute or two, then we'll discuss it. So 
So pretend you're President Wilwright, and Brother Masson and Brother Ritchie are coming to you with this idea of something that BYU Hawaii should try. If you're President Wilwright, what are you gonna ask us? What are you gonna to try to shoot it down about? But there's something more funny on your screen, right? <laughs> well, jot it down so you can remember it. Come on, Charles, I need your help here on this. Brainstorm this. I'm good. You're good? I'm no good. Not good. How many think Charles could come up with at least one idea to mention? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> I do. Yeah. He's already had, f you probably would have 800 negative thoughts in your life, right? I told you I'm at 1440. 1450, maybe. April. Can they know the why? The why? Yeah, it is, yeah. The why? I mean, why? All right, okay, okay. Let, let's spend a minute more thinking and then you can ask me that question and I'll try to pitch you on it, okay? So for a week long, and then so it's like, so it's like similar to the classes that they take throughout the spread that week, obviously, right? How long would the classes be each? And how many people would be involved as far as teaching? Five or six instructors. How yeah. long would the class period be? We'd have you know a class at from nine to ten thirty, something else from ten thirty to noon, a lunch meeting, afternoon golf, you know. So there'd be play time associated with uh -huh. field trips and stuff like that. Yeah. Both would bring in a, a couple of social entrepreneurs that have done things uh, and let them have real world experience and then a couple of, of professors to facilitate the discussions. And we'd, we'd try to focus on having a lot of interaction between the couples to try and share what they're thinking, what their plans are, what they want to do and getting feedback from other couples to say, you know, how are we gonna do it? Like, a couple ideas. Uh, one, uh, have a panel discussion with some ideas like, uh, a title of it is, uh, how to deal with grandchild separation anxiety. Or another one is, how do I leave my pillow top king size mattress? How many, what would be the minimum amount of couples that you would need to do it? Uh, I think uh, we would shoot for a, a beta test with 20. If we could get 20 couples to try it, then we'll see if it flies. That's what I'd like to do is immediately get this underway and try it once. Why not do it in Utah? Uh, because Utah is cold uh, and uh, I think we could leverage off being in Hawaii. Yeah, but late winter is not kind of like a as far as family, wait, so this is marketed to people that have the children gone in a way? That they have the children in the well, home? It says yeah. It's marketed to people who are financially, they've already made it financially, and now they're trying to figure out what they do, what's the next step. Is so, that true? Is that what's marketed to? Yeah. So even if you had like children, that age group you have there is still, mm -hmm. you're looking at people that they're not, they're not so much concerned about how do you get here? It's, does it excite me? Does it excite me to be there? If that makes sense. Um. By the time you're 35, like by the time my parents were 35, I was old, like old enough to babysit, so they would take off for a week honeymoon mm -hmm. and just leave me and my older brother in charge and pay us like $50 mm -hmm. for the day. Yeah. What, 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 to answer April's question, Stephen April will write. Um, the why of this is I see a, a huge gap in offering executive education for LDS people. 
you'll go to Harvard and you'll pull up executive education at Harvard or Stanford or Wharton and they will have a class a week and they'll be charging four to eight thousand dollars a week to come to Harvard for a week and learn about XYZ endeavor you know uh, marketing uh, they have several in social entrepreneurship they had a how to sit on the board of a nonprofit organization. You can go there for a week and take a course in that at Harvard, and you'll pay you know, $4,500 to do that for a week at Harvard. Uh, and so there is a lot of education directed right now at adults. It's called executive education. And yet, I don't see that there's anyone right now offering it to the LDS market. You know, that have, you know, we have unique issues and cultural things that make it an excellent niche market to go after and try to help adult LDS to focus on it. And especially, I don't see anywhere, I could not find anywhere in the country where they're focusing their adult education, their executive education, on couples. It's always just, you know, one person. You know, the leader, you know, if you sit on the board of a company or you're the CEO of a company, come and take this course. But none of them are saying, come and the two of you together as husband and wife, come and learn together and figure out. And, and I couldn't find hardly anything that talked about, there were some that are in the financial realm. You know, you, you, you go to see a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch or something when you want to have some couple's help for your financial future. You know, there's lots of ads on TV about figuring out your financial future as a couple, but I didn't see any of them that are focusing on plan your life. You know, focus on what you're going to be doing, yes, financially, but also emotionally and compassionate service and try to change the world. How are you going to do any of that? So this idea is to focus on people to try and do some total life planning for the second half of your life. I mean, think about it. When you're your age, you know, you have, you know, you go through young men, young women, you take seminary, uh, you go to institute, you go on a mission, you get married in the temple, you have children, and that's sort of where our milestones stop. You know, we don't have a lot of pre-planned milestones beyond that. So I think this is a great opportunity to bring people that are getting ready for their second half of their life, you know, post kids, empty nesters, to try and make some real plans to do something with the second half of their life. Does that explain the why a little bit more? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Tony, what other question do you have for us? Uh, from my understanding, like, your target, the people you're targeting for this program are couples from 35 to 65. And for them to come as a couple, I think that any married couple that are able to pay for this kind of program and travel all the way to come here and come as a couple, that there's a high probability that they have they've already established themselves that what you're trying to teach them and the what they already know. Because I, I think this kind of lesson showed will be more beneficial to couples who have not gotten to this level in their life. Okay, I think that's a. So you're saying if you have the time and money to come to Hawaii for a week, you're probably already sharp enough that you maybe already will know the things we'll discuss, and we need to maybe focus on the 35-year-old couple that's still struggling to pay the bills and hopefully will one day be ready for this, but they need to have a path to get to this point. Right. Other opinions? Well, maybe you shouldn't even start with those who are 35, you know, or those that are 40, because if you start right there, I mean, like, let's say you switch and you start with those who are struggling to pay the bills. Well, yeah, by the time you know, they're there, you know, if you've reached 35 and you're set up to be able to make that trip to Hawaii, you're set up to do these things. Well, yeah, you've already got the sharpness, but it took you, you know, 15 years to get that far. So if you start with somebody who's 35, by the time they're 50, they may have become set up to the point where 
they can actually benefit you. So I mean, you're looking at a really long term. It may be better if you started even earlier, so you're telling people, hey, when you're 20, plan ahead now so that you can do these things when you're 35 or 40. What, how old was Brother Richie when he retired? 35. So when he was in college, he set some goals and he wanted to be retired by 35. When did he actually hit his financial target? How old was he? Did he make it by 35? He, he hit it at age 30. And he, he was double his goal by age 35, he wrote in one of his books. Uh, so he had, you know, that, that's the importance. You remember we talked about only 3% of Americans have written goals? He had that goal and he kept referring to it. You know, most of us, if you don't, in fact, I, I promise you this, if you don't set your goals to do something by a certain age, you probably aren't going to make it because it won't stay in your mind. You'll let it evaporate. You'll say, well, I was young, I was in college, I was, you know, I was optimistic, you know, I was, I was Anthony thinking I, had, I could do everything, and now that the real world has smacked me around a bit, there's no way I'm going to be able to retire at 35. You know, so if you don't have it written down, I guarantee you the waves of the world will swamp you, and you will forget your goal. And you'll say, ah, oh, that was unrealistic. JJ. Is the, could the post-professional life class seminar be, um, be, in, be in Utah for one week? Would that be able to get more people to participate in this class than saying, uh, I have a professional teacher from BYU Hawaii coming to visit Utah for one week to teach us? Okay. Right. I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we need to be locked into Hawaii or Utah. We could try both. Okay. Yeah. For the first beta test to see if we could draw enough people, would you suggest doing it first in Utah or first doing it in Hawaii? Well, obviously, it'd be easier in Utah because uh, you have quadruple the number of people that are in the north part. But my thing is, your paradox is that if somebody like myself or in our age group here in this class that are married, this would be very attractive to try to get to where we want to go yeah. in all aspects. However, we wouldn't be able to afford it, obviously. And then the flip side is that people who have already made it, it's you're you're narrowing. Even though the age gap is, is broad, 35 to 65, but there's a lot of people that facilitate those age gaps. However, there's a you're very narrowed. I feel in regards to people already thinking maybe they're above this. Like, oh, I've already been there. I've done this. It's the couples that are financially successful and made it, but yet they feel stagnant in their lives. How can we make a difference? I've, I've done well in my business. I've done well here and there, but. Yeah, I feel unfulfilled because I feel like it's all been centered. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's who we're going to. Okay, how do we reach them? That's what I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I mean can, you, can you write in your marketing and say, are you unfulfilled? Are you stagnant? I mean, is, that gonna, is anyone going to say, oh, that's me? They're doing it all and feel worthless, you know? Yeah. You know, you, you have to plan your marketing so you don't offend your target market. Over here. I was just going to Okay. All right, back here, Michael. I was just doing a quick run through as far as the actual costs. So, like, per couple, it's going to cost maybe around four thousand dollars round trip uh, for the couple between the university and the airfare and the board, along with seventy fifty for grace and the treatment. So, that might be something that uh, people would want to look at and really want to make sure. So, when you have um, people coming over here, you want to make sure that it's worth uh, that full four thousand dollars that they pay to an actual trip. Okay. So were you thinking, you know, let's say it's $5,000 per couple total cost. Is that going to be too much? What, what, what's your gut say? Is that, are we not going to find 20 affluent LDS couples to do that? All right. It, I know lots of hands. Just on that specific point, will we find enough people that will do that? Eventually. Carla. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that to make it more effective, you can just do a viewing conference. So you don't have to fly people into Hawaii, and that would drop the cost for the people who want to sign up. So you're saying do it again in Utah? Video conference. Oh, video conference. So then you can just set it up that way, and you're not wasting time with Okay. Will people be as into it with a video conference? I mean, for a, you could do that for a couple hours, but. 
is that really going to get them to change their life and lay out a full plan of what they want to do for the next 30 years? All right. All right. On the specific question, is $5,000 too much for your target audience, Ryan? Um, I think your price is actually pretty low. Um, a lot of the entrepreneurs that come here, that participate in both conferences, they, they will have contributed at, at a minimum $7,000 to the school to uh -huh. be on the PLC committee. Uh -huh. That's the threshold. So to be able to only pay $750 to take the same types of classes, that the other groups are paying at minimum seven thousand just to be included in the class. Mm -hmm. is, is All right. So Ryan thinks. Do you think we could get twenty couples to come to this? I, is, I think as long as you have solid presenters um, that you show that you have backing at the school, and I think you need to show that all of that money is going back to the school. That you're not paying it. If it's an SE function, you're not giving it. No one's making money off of it then I think you'll get people to, to support it. Okay, so. Uh, you market it the right way. You market it to those people that you, you say, like you drop hard. People that have money and are established want to know that they're not going to spend a Mickey Mouse, you know, weekend or weekend in Hawaii, you know. They've probably been to Hawaii many times. These are people that are traveling the world, you know, whatever. So they're coming to better themselves, but otherwise. So you market it, dropping Harvard, dropping you, people that are established and saying, hey, this is, just so you know, if you were to go to a little function like this, Okay. You know. When you're evaluating, write down your write down your notes of your questions so we can get to them. Okay, so you don't forget your questions. But I'm not going to call on you for a sec. Oh. Sorry, no. I'm not going to call on you. No, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, but but don't but don't forget your question oh, unless it's. Question. I'm just saying it's not about money at all. It has nothing to do with the price. Hmm. This is a, this is uh, the negotiating about the price isn't effective at all. They're going to want, it's all about the need that they have to fill to come. Okay. Let, when, when someone presents you with a business idea, you have to be ready to do the math in your head to quickly see whether they are totally stupid and illogical and, and unrealistic or whether it's possible. So walk through some math with me here. How, how many members of the church do we have right now? 14. 14 million, okay. All right. How many, how many of those are adults? If an average of, let's say, three kids a family or, well, just what do you guess? What do you say? Five million? Five million are adults. And let's say a million of those are single, right? So let's get down to four million. And then how many of those are active? Half? Okay, so two million, and those are husband and wife, so we get to maybe one million adult active couples in the church. I didn't even narrow it down to Temple Recommend Holy. Okay, well, okay. You know all right, so how many, how many of those are? are I've heard a number, there's like 800,000 Temple Recommend Holy members in the world. Okay, so this is high, so let's take it down to half a million. Okay, there's half a million couples at most. Okay, how many, and how many of these people have a net worth of over half a million? Now what would you guess? I've heard of half a quarter. In the world, in your uh, of, these, of these LDS half a million couples, how many of them have a net worth of a million dollars? What, what's, how many per, what's the percentage of millionaires in the United States? Two or three percent? Yeah. Okay, so let's assume two percent. Are most of our members in like South America and South America? Half, half are outside the United States. Okay, so two percent of 500,000 is what? 10,000 couples have active, Temple Recommend Holders, LDS, net worth of over a million. Okay, so that is our target market. We're trying to get 20 of 10,000 couples. If we get 20, what's our penetration rate? 
What's 1% of 10,000? What's 1% of 10,000? What? 100. Can you believe how many different numbers we heard right then? OK. So if we get 20, we'll have 0.2% penetration rate. Did you say 1% or 10%? What? Yeah. yeah. Right. right. 100 times 10 is 1,000. Right. That's not 1%. This is 10,000, not 1,000. Oh, 10,000. Okay. No, 10,000. Okay. Okay. All right. So, do you think we can get 0.2% penetration of our target audience, our market? Possibly. I mean, I, I, I think we could get 20 couples out of 10,000 in the world. I, I think that's doable. And you get 100 couples. Well, we hope to keep getting 20 every year, you know, 20, 30, 40 every year. All right, All right you gave you a comment, all right. Back here, that? I was gonna say, going, going into the marketing aspects, um, I think it would be a good idea to offer them a mentorship program beyond this actual course to help, help guide them in their direction, maybe set them on their way, and then um, have, have an individual or, or a mentor to Okay. To Gr great idea. Does it have to be a mentor, or can it be the other couples? Can you come and bond with two or three other couples that are like-minded, and then you stay in contact with them after you go, and you help each other with your ideas of what you want to do. What, which way do you think it has to be? That would be one of the best benefits of that is, is connecting and networking with all the people that come. Yeah. That would be worth it in and of itself, I think. Yeah, okay. Ooh, I like that, see? I like that. That would be worth it in and of itself. One of the best things about, uh, about this book was he called it the, let's see if I can find it real quick here. Measure the wow factor. When you tell someone this idea, he says, do they tilt their head and say, wow? You know, that little, wow. And so if enough people do that, he said, that's a good mark that you have a good idea. Oh, wow, where are you? Would you, we're obviously not gonna get to any more of your comments. Would you email me more of your comments, okay, that we didn't get to share? Especially, I'll give some nice, extra credit if you analyze this idea along these eight points and say, uh, no, oh good, that'll work, that'll work, nah, uh, you know. Tell me, tell me how it fits with this, you know, okay. Any last comments? Remember, I already gave you the assignment. I'll post it uh, probably later today or tomorrow. What, does anyone remember what our assignment is? What? No. That, no. That, that, that's bonus. Remember the assignment is over Thanksgiving, talk for 20 minutes to an entrepreneur in your home ward or stake, and I will give you, I will submit to you a list of questions to ask them. Okay? So your homework is to call somebody at home and talk to them about their background. Yes. Can I be my parents? No, it has to be has to be someone you've never talked to about this before. Which is a theory where where the where um, the guy a guy by the name of Bill Juice came up with. He was a colleague of Guy at an IBM before. He said whenever he presented, he would always think that there's a little man sitting on his shoulder, and every time. He asked every time he, um, you know, you said something. The little man would say, "So what?" You know, like, um, so, he, so kind of like I'll give you an example here. Um, so you're presenting, you say something like, "Oh, we use digital signal processing in our hearing aids," and the little man would ask you, "So what?" You know, you reply, or you say, um, "Our products increase the clarity of sound." So you pretty much tell people what exactly do you do? You know, like how, how are you going to change? How are you going to, you know, tackle problems like that? So that's, that's one of the things I learned is pretty cool when you're presenting it. Let's keep that in mind. The other thing is the uh, 10, 20, 30 rule. Um, I don't know if um, 
if any of you heard that before when presenting. It's, I think it's a really good uh, way to present. 10, 30, uh, 10, 20, 30 will pretty much, I mean, so 10 slides, uh, keep it to 10 slides, keep it under 20 minutes, and use 30 point font. I, I'm pretty sure most of you guys sit through presentations where the people like have really like huge chunks of paragraphs and they're presenting. You can't even read it on that, and, and it's really annoying, I think. And it just puts people to sleep. So, so um, yes, by the this rule, like what he's saying is pretty much um, keep it short, keep it precise, um, and keep it interesting, I guess, so people could you know fall through easily. That's a 10 point 30 rule. Um, okay, the last thing I'm going to share is with this book. It's um, it's called the uh, it's chapter I think chapter chapter two. Yeah, it's called the and he says in every business. There's an entrepreneur, a manager, and a technician. In every, in every like business you run, like there's the, always an entrepreneur. The guy who has the idea maybe, who funds the business. There's also the manager who you know take care of everything, um, kind of you know, you know leads the business. And also there's a technician, the guy that does you know the work, the technical work of the business. And I think that's interesting to look at. If you have any organization, they have like you know CEO, CFO, it's just like pretty much like that structure they have for. This applies actually more to you know, small businesses and stuff like that. So, um, and that's yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's just some of the things I learned that was interesting, of course. But there's tons of it. Feel free to look at the books. So. Right. Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> See, I, I even have my copy with me today as well. <laughs> so, uh, that that chapter three, I think we should use for training for the. Uh, uh, the Conference of Champions training to help you present your business plan. So if you're looking for help to know how to best present your business plan in March, Chapter 3, The Art of the Pitch is a good one. Yes, Ryan. Yeah, when we did our business plan last year, we actually modeled it after the, the, the model and the art of the start. Uh, it was much more effective. Because business plans, they're like 20, 30 pages, some of them. And there's a lot of detail that um, you can't really go over in a short pitch. And so we used a lot of the principles from that book and it ended up it helped us. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. He has five ideas or the thesis of this book. Uh, his first one is make meaning. Uh, you know, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to change the world? What, come up with something that will be significant. You know, what's the meaning of your organization? You know, have, a, have that purpose, have, define what that is. Uh, then he says, make mantra. What's a mantra? It's like you're rallying. Yeah. <laughs> you have a smile on your face there. Well, as a, as a chant the money mantra and all the moral voices will go away quickly enough. It, the, it's, it's, it's a line from something. Money, money, money. Yeah, yeah. Just, just chant the money mantra and all the moral voices will go away quickly enough. Okay, what's, what's the... Tom Cruise mantra in when he was a sports agent. Show me the money. Okay, so that was the mantra from that. So mantra is like a catchphrase, you know, a pithy, clever way of saying your purpose. You know, so you, you make your meaning and then you package it in a mantra. You know, some way that you can, you know, really catch people's attention. I mean, look, look at the title of his book. Isn't that a clever mantra? The Art of the Start. Art of the Start. You know, here's, here's another one we've been reading uh, called Boom Start. Boom Start. Not quite as good as The Art of the Start, but, uh, you know, you're going to remember this one. I mean, th think how clever, you know, he has the rhyming there. And he also, uh, it makes you think, oh, starting business is an art. You know, and you think of your creative side. Um, so he thinks of a catchphrase. Uh, and you know, he says catchphrases, and that these guys are really big on that. The, this is actually it's interesting. This guy was written, this book was written by a venture capitalist. This book was written by three BYU marketing professors. So their approach to starting a, an enterprise is really seen through the lens of marketing. They think the most important thing in starting a business is selling and marketing. Oh, wow, that's strange to come up with that opinion. 
And, you know, he talks a lot less about marketing and starting and selling in his book than these guys do. But he talked about catchphrases. And he, he thinks that, you know, when we were younger, 20, 30 years ago, catchphrases were used better than they are today. Right now, he, he thinks that all the new advertising coming along, they think they have to come up with a new catchphrase to replace their old one instead of coming up with a new ad campaign to support the old established catchphrase. Like, what's the current catchphrase for McDonald's? <laughs> Wasn't that Burger King? See, he's saying most people can't remember the current McDonald's tagline. Who said it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, what are some of the old ones that you remember better? Okay, Campbell's Soup, mm, good. What's 7-Up's catchphrase? I it's funny, I don't remember that one at all. Are you kidding? That one was all the rage when I was in school. Do the do. Okay, do the do is going, but does anyone remember what 7-Ups? Quench your thirst. That's thirst quencher. That's right. 7-Up, the Uncola. Remember that one? The Uncola? Oh, sorry. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? What, what was that one? Wendy's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was the old McDonald's one? What? No, no, I'm loving it. Was just recently. Uh huh. Do any of you remember the big failed McDonald's launch? They had a big new product they pushed and it failed. What was it called? Arch, the Arch, Arch Deluxe. Deluxe. Yeah. They spent, uh, they estimate $300 million to launch it. Mm -hmm. And the problem was they, it took the fun out of it. Arch Deluxe was more, they're trying to capture more of the adult market and it took away the fun of going to McDonald's. I mean, what is the, the meaning? If you were starting at McDonald's and your first point here is make meaning, what would it be for McDonald's? Food, family, fun. The three Fs, food, family, fun. That's, that's McDonald's meaning. You go there, you play on the, the things, you get the happy meal with your kids, you go celebrate. Haven't you seen their ad campaign lately where they, you go celebrate an event in your life with your dad or your mom and you go to McDonald's to celebrate? Yeah. So family, food, fun. So Arch Deluxe didn't, support that message. And it was a, a colossal failure for them. Have any of you been surprised to how, you know, how long, you know, obviously we aren't big coffee drinkers here on campus, but you know, you've heard how much a Starbucks cup of coffee costs, right? Okay. Are you surprised that it's taken so long for Burger King and McDonald's to go after that? What's Burger King's new pitch for coffee? Free coffee Fridays, okay? And McDonald's, they're building, when they tear down this old McDonald's here near campus and put in a new one, you're gonna see all the emphasis they put on